Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul aka Han Yolo and this video we're breaking down the first two episodes of Obi-Wan Kenobi. The new Disney Plus series has just dropped and it's filled with easter eggs, hidden details and a lot of references to the greater universe. Full spoilers ahead from this point on but we'd massively appreciate the thumbs up and if you want to stay locked to the breakdowns for the next 5 weeks then make sure subscribe you do. With that out of the way, thanks for clicking this, off to a good start, now let's get into Obi-Wan Kenobi. Ok so when we last saw Obi-Wan we were watching him taking the moral and literal high ground as he got rid of his apprentice like Alan Sugar. You blew it, you're fired. The Jedi had fallen and Order 66 was now in full effect with the last remaining Jedi having to hide out in the bowels of the universe. After dropping Luke off at his aunt and uncles, Obi-Wan left on his EOP who ends up popping up again. Jedi's hiding out after Order 66 and taking menial jobs is something that was a big focus in Fallen Order and in that we watch Cal Kestis hiding out whilst the Inquisitors search for the rest of his kind. Inquisitors make a big entrance in these episodes and along with the new one Reaver, we also have some of the classic ones like the Grand Inquisitor and Brother 5 that we'll talk about in just a bit. Now we open on the planet of Coruscant getting introduced to some of the younglings that ended up getting drafted into this. We see the events of Order 66 play out first hand and this show really goes from 0 to 100 parsecs in this space of a couple of seconds. This is Jedi Valti who defends the children and this opening tells the story of what I believe is the origin of Reva. We learn that she is the third sister, a reckless inquisitor that strikes first and asks questions later but here it seems like she's just a scared kid. Reading the online discourse I've actually seen some people triggered over this because of recent world events and it is pretty harrowing to watch this play out from the perspective of children. Obviously the creative team didn't know this would happen when making this scene and taken on its own, I think this is one of the most powerful moments in Star Wars history. Now we discover Reva later on is fixated on Kenobi but don't learn why this is. However she might see him as being the person that left her to fend for herself and for also being the reason for the creation of Darth Vader, the man who likely tormented her after the events of Order 66. This is a major moment in Star Wars history that has been brought up across a number of media including Fallen Order, Clone Wars and The Bad Batch. Cut to 10 years later and we find ourselves on Tatooine, namely Mos Eisley. We can see this by the crashed ship in the middle which you might recognise from A New Hope. It's a hustling hive of scum and villainy that reminds me of my comment section and the black shadow of the Inquisitor ship looms overhead. Shadows have been used at several points throughout Star Wars films to show dominance and here it's no different. The black ship and uniform of the Inquisitor cuts out against the white desert planet and its structure makes for a highly contrasted image that adds a lot of weight to their arrival. Now in case you don't know, Inquisitors are basically Jedi hunting force sensitive soldiers that scour the galaxy looking for the remnants of the Order. They're all extremely tragic figures and at one point most of them were actually Jedi themselves. Between the events of Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, Darth Vader built up a group of them and he enhanced their abilities by teaching them the ways of the dark side. Typically Sith always come in too with her being a master and an apprentice However, nice little loophole here, you can actually have as many as you want as long as you call them Inquisitors. Now the Jedi were of course called Peacekeepers and the Inquisitors are very much a black mirror of them, keeping the peace through oppression. Beyond that though, the Inquisitors were assembled together after the Emperor sensed a new threat rising and this came in the form of children who slowly started to tap into their abilities. Luke is of course on Tatooine doing this and doesn't Disney's de-aging keep getting better and better? Look. Look how good he looks now. Now as for the Grand Inquisitor, he made his debut all the way back in the Star Wars Rebels premiere. Initially voiced by Jason Isaacs, he's now played by Rupert Friend, who's the foe you wanna look out for. My homie Grand Inquisitor is a poor on male who actually worked as a temple god on Coruscant. When the Jedi Order fell, Vader ended up taking him under his wing and acting like a mentor to him, though he was probably a bit of a dead. Now he basically rules over all the other Inquisitors, including fifth brother, 6th brother, 7th sister, 8th brother and 9th sister. What's terrifying about the group is that they wield double bladed lightsabers with circular handles that spin around mercilessly during combat. Now because the character has already popped up in other shows and comics, we know what happens to him and he will be making it past the events of the series. I'll do some spoilers, not for this show yet, but I haven't seen it, but just for his arc in general now so if you don't want to know what happens to him in the future or in things like Rebels or the comics, and skip ahead. Anyway in Rebels he managed to capture Kanan Jarrus and Ezra and Co ended up going to save him. Both Kanan and Bridger ended up having a lightsaber battle with him 
and it appeared that he killed them at one point. This spurred Kanan on to fight as hard as he could, but Ezra didn't actually die. He once more tried doing the baton twirling technique, and during this, Kanan put his lightsabers in the middle and bust up the handle, which sent the blades over the edge into the ship's reactor. This started off a chain reaction, and the Inquisitor fell to his death, even though Kanan did try to save him. He said that there were some fates worse than death as he plummeted in, and in the comics, we discovered that Vader trapped his soul on Tempest, where he was forced to serve as a guardian for the Jedi outpost there. Luke battled it out with his spirit and he won, but the Inquisitor still remained behind. He asked to be freed from his torment by Vader, but he went, nah chump, see you later. See you chump. Here they are hunting for Jedi, and no one suspects the Grand Inquisitor. Now I know that people don't really like the design, especially with a Puon popping up in Revenge of the Sith and looking way better, but you know, you just kind of have to go with it. The guy is super intimidating and definitely riffing on hands from Inglorious Bastards. We can catch the patrons also drinking blue milk and shout out Simon A. Berman for pointing out that these are in the same cups Luke had in A New Hope. We're told that the Jedi's compassion is their weakness and see this in full effect when they attempt to throw a knife at a bartender, which the Jedi then stops. He manages to escape and we cut to Obi-Wan who's working for a small crew cutting meat off what I believe is a crate dragon fin. This is something we saw in The Mandalorian as well, with its hide being transformed into a massive steak. Like Cal Kestis, he's having to lie low and basically do this job in order to stay fed. We watch a worker only getting half the credits he should have through using a gonk droid as a clocking in and out machine. In the Star Wars universe, these are basically walking batteries and they've always gotten dunked on. More like dunk droid 8, now later on, it shoots steam out of its top, which is of course playing on real world factories. Now in the comics we learned a lot about old Ben's time on Tatooine when Luke went back to get his journals. He often put survival above being a Jedi and he let injustices happen on the planet so long as it kept him hidden. This pulled from the comics the journals of Obi-Wan Kenobi which the series seems to be based upon quite a lot. We see one of these injustices happen at this moment as a worker's pay gets half off like Darth Maul and Obi-Wan doesn't help out. This is long before he established a home and Obi-Wan lives out in a cave which of course represents how ostracized the Jedi are at this point. A Jawa called Chicken Tika arrives and they say that they could smell him from Anchorhead, which was one of the first settlements on Tatooine. It was basically a central hub for everyone and it offered quick and easy travel to other ports on the planet, as well as ships off world, which is why Boba wanted to go there during the first episode of his solo show. With him he's brought a T-16 model, which is a gift for Luke, who actually ended up playing with one in A New Hope. Tika also brings with them the news of the other Jedi at the start, and this sets Obi-Wan off a bit that night. Now we get moments from Padme, flashes of the good and bad times with Anakin, Yoda, and Qui-Gon, who Obi-Wan attempts to reach out to. As we discovered at the end of Revenge of the Sith, Qui-Gon had learned how to become a Force Ghost, which explained why only Ben, Yoda, and Anakin ended up doing it, even though we had countless Jedi at one point. He doesn't appear in these first two episodes, but this could be hinting to him coming down the line. Now that morning we catch a scurrier, a little native creature on Tatooine that's often confused with a womp rat. We also get the moment from the trailers with Obi-Wan looking over Luke and this actually pulls directly from the comics in which he looked over him. He is of course pretending that he's pod racing which his father did and I love the little reference to Anakin here. Now Joel Edgerton is playing Owen Laws and he's once more reprising his role from Revenge of the Sith before he was a star. In the books and this series Obi-Wan knew that he should be training Luke and though this could put him in danger, it would better prepare him in case the Emperor ever found him. Obi-Wan knew that the temptation of the Sith was very powerful and that if he hadn't been trained in the ways of the Jedi first, that he would instantly give into it. Now on the other side of this was Owen who he just he just wanted a nice easy life. He just liked being having a barbecue and getting barbecued as well. Now after Obi-Wan sent Luke a gift, Owen angrily returned it and told him to stay out of Luke's life. However, Owen did somewhat come to appreciate him after Obi-Wan saved the pair from Black Crescentin. You'll likely recognize him from the book of Boba Fett, and I think that they purposely introduced the character there so that it's way more impactful when he shows up in this series. Potentially, might not show up, but I would love to see him in this one. Now Jabba had started running an extortionate water tax on moisture farmers in the area, and Obi-Wan put a stop to this. Crescentin was sent out by Jabba to find the man who'd cut off some of his income, and he took Owen hostage to draw Obi-Wan out. The pair ended up fighting each other and Obi-Wan won, with Crescentin fleeing the planet for some time, which I think would be an awesome storyline to drop in this series. Now Obi-Wan ends up leaving the T-16 model for Luke that night, and Nari the Jedi arrives after spotting him in town. 
Obi-Wan immediately denies who he is, refusing to help and even giving the name Ben. This is of course a complete opposite to how he was with Luke in A New Hope, when he was like, yep, that's me, punk, I'm the chump. Now he's very much turned his back on being a Jedi and he refuses to help Nari, even telling him to bury his lightsaber in the desert, similar to what Rey did at the end of Rise of Skywalker. He says the time of the Jedi is over, a line that riffs upon Luke saying that the time of the Jedi has passed in The Last Jedi. Both were extremely broken and had basically shut themselves off from the Force. Now next we jump to Alderaan and find out that Leia has got herself into Alderaan places, eh? Hey, on that? Now along with the droid Lola, she runs through the forest, possibly foreshadowing the training she would have later on as a Jedi with Luke. I have to say, it's the best I've seen Alderaan looking, cause, oh. Now Leia shouts out the ships as they pass and we get a Tri-Wing, which is actually a brand new ship for the Star Wars universe that was designed by Porsche. She also mentions the Aquilan Rangers, which were a group synonymous with the Rebels. Leia is sick of being put on parade and Owen is sick of looking up and seeing Obi-Wan constantly spying on his kid. It's a bit weird. It's weird. Now also at this moment, Owen drops a really important line about how Anakin is dead. At this point, Obi-Wan didn't actually realise that he'd become Darth Vader, and to him, he'd just been left cooking over what he'd become. This is a bombshell that Reva drops on him later in order to taunt him, and it feels very similar when Vader was taunting Luke in Return of the Jedi. The Inquisitors arrive once more, and I have to hand it to them, they don't mess about. Owen kind of voices his true feelings about the Jedi and his family, who he of course ended up looking like, I have to stop this. Now Reva promises to murder them if the Jedi doesn't come forward, and even though we know Owen makes it to a new hub, it's still a really tense scene. Obi-Wan refuses to step out of the shadows, and he very much confirms that the Jedi wouldn't put themselves in harm's way in order to help, even though Nari did. Now back on Alderaan, Jimmy Smith is back baby, and we also see C-3PO, who was of course at one point a droid that belonged to him and his family. This is confirmed by the subtitles for the show, and we also get Y-O, which is Yo. Now Leia's cousin is a spoilt little <laughs> who taunts her for not being a true Organa, but she does a character assassination on him, perhaps even using the Force in some ways to reach into his mind. There is a slight second where she seems to sense it, and later on, she does this psychoanalysis stuff on Obi-Wan. Now Leia says that she'd rather be eaten by a Jacobeast than apologise to him, and these monsters come from snow-ridden planets and are basically giant tigers. Bale brings up how he wanted to chase Pergal when he was younger, and these giant space whales basically allow characters to become the Star Wars version of Moby Dick. He says that one day the planet will look to her, which, mm, rather than putting diplomacy above her own feelings though, she decides to run off, but trouble awaits. At this point we meet Vect, played by Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Now though this chase was goofy, I did kind of enjoy these scenes overall, and I think it was a smart call to have some variety to the surroundings, rather than having us always stuck on Tatooine. The Organas reach out to Obi-Wan for help in the form of a hologram, which is of course a nod to Leia doing the same thing to him in A New Hope. At this point we see that Nari has been captured and hung up for the entire city to see. Once more Obi-Wan sees himself as failing to save a young Jedi, and when Bale comes to him to beg personally, he decides to finally step up. He asks Obi-Wan to travel to Dayu, which is a neon sign-laden Blade Runner-esque style planet. In the interviews with Entertainment Weekly, writer Joby Harold said it's got this sort of Hong Kong feel to it, and it's very captivating to look at. After digging his lightsaber up along with Anakin's, he ends up travelling out to save her, which we discover is a trap set by Reva. Need to let it go, love. Now, I do think they heavily foreshadow that her hunt for him will be her downfall, and it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. On Dayu, he meets a clone trooper, and we see what happened to them after the events of the war. Played once more by Tamira Morrison, I absolutely love this cameo, and catching that he's now a homeless beggar carries a lot of subtext with it. We are often criticised as a society for having far too many homeless veterans, and just like us, the Imperials clearly didn't look after them. In the Bad Batch, we watched firsthand as the Empire realised that the price of clones was too high to be constantly paying that, and thus they started just conscripting citizens into their ranks. They were forced to fight, which also explains why the accuracy and efficiency of the stormtroopers went downhill. In what's a great shot, we get the old being replaced by the new, and we, we meet the new guys who are basically a downgrade. Now there's a lot of talk online at the moment that there's a cameo by Mark Hamill, which when I first seen it, I was like, yep, yeah, definitely him. However, upon inspecting it a bit closer, zooming in, brightening up, I'm not sure that it's definitely him, but you know, the next couple of days we'll probably find out. So if it is him, then 
edit edit this bit out mentally where I said it wasn't him, and add in a bit mentally where I say this next bit. It's definitely him. Now having him appear would of course massively mess up the Star Wars canon, as Obi-Wan is meant to be looking over him as a child, but either way, you know, it's a nice touch. If it is him. He runs into a drug dealer, potentially playing on the Death Sticks 1 in Attack of the Clones, who was played by the same guy that was Mouse from the Matrix. A little kid then comes up and offers to take him to a Jedi named Hajar, who has apparently been helping people on the planet. Played by Kumail Nanjani, this guy definitely lightens the tone of what's been a pretty dour run so far. We quickly discover he's not a Jedi though, and that he's in fact running a con. He offers a mother and child safe passage to Corellia, aka the home planet of Han Solo. After getting some info, we get some Obi-Wan beard stroking, which is always good, and after he locates what I'm guessing is a meth, sorry, spice lab, he dresses up like Walt in Breaking Bad and heads in. Spice is a narcotic in the Star Wars universe, heavily based on the one of the same name from Dune, and Lucas admitted to taking inspiration from this. Sneaking into the back, he runs into two gods, one of which is a Zabrak, aka the same species as Darth Maul. Obi-Wan is careful to use only his fists and blasters on this planet as he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. Say for example, if the Empire hears of someone shooting someone, they're not going to be too interested. However, if they hear that someone was struck down with a lightsaber, it's a different story and they'll send the Inquisitors there until they find the culprit. In the words of Admiral Akbar, it's a trap and he's caught but he manages to escape after setting off the spice, which A. Walt also did that in Breaking Bad to escape. He finds Leia in a holding cell, and we get a scene that very much riffs on Luke rescuing her in A New Hope. She gives him the typical sass she's known for that she got from not only her mother, but also I feel Anakin. Guy was always back chatting too, and it's nice to see how her parents kind of formed her character. Hi as sh**, Reva comes and learns that Kenobi is indeed on the planet. It's revealed this is very much a power play to gain favour with Vader, but the rest of the Inquisitors aren't happy as she had to kidnap Leia to do it which will cause some issues with the Senate. From here the show goes very John Wick and wanted ads are sent out with every bounty hunter getting a text about him. We see one that looks like a velociraptor and this is actually a member of the race, Tisha, who looks similar to the dinosaur. Almost everyone is after him and there's a real tense feeling to this scene as they try and lock down the area, hunting him in Leia as he moves through the shadows. Also, can we get a shout out to Hong Kang who plays fifth brother in the show. Guy also plays Han in Fast and the Furious, and it really makes me want to get justice for Han, Solo. Also, Leia is placed in a green coat, which I think is meant to look similar to the overall that she wore on Endor. After sprinting off, we get a similar scene to when Omega left in the Bad Batch, and she races throughout the city, which is when everyone starts to close in. I believe one of these is a member of the Pike Clan, who we had run-ins with in the Clone Wars, the Bad Batch, Solo, and Book of Boba Fett. Reva does some parkour, as she chases after the pair on rooftops, whilst they're fired at by the Tisha, Tisha, Tisha. Alea ends up falling, but Obi-Wan reaches inside himself, and finally he embraces the Force once more and saves her life. Haja ends up redeeming himself too, and we discover that he got the family safe and just wants to help the Jedi. It shows how the Jedi are very much a force for good that inspire people throughout the galaxy, and, you know, their removal, it just made morale dip across the entire universe. Or galaxy, I always get in trouble saying universe, so I'll just... I'll just say Galaxy again. Now he ends up using his performance skills to buy time and Reva dives into his mind much like how we saw Kylo Ren doing it in The Force Awakens. The Grand Inquisitor kills Vec whilst doing his Thanos helicopter move and Reva tracks the pair to the cargo bay. We actually see Obi-Wan hiding out which is a major change up for the character. This is a guy that just jumped headfirst into fighting General Grievous and it's wild seeing him scared for once. Saved by the bell, end. The Grand Inquisitor arrives as Reva almost gets to him. She ends up stabbing him, but as we've already talked about, he does survive this in the canon, and likely won't be too happy that he got back, well, front stabbed. Now we end with Vader waking up in his back to the tank, and what a way to reveal the character. Hopefully we don't get 20 flashbacks whilst he's in this next time, but it's such a cool way to close out these first two entries. Anyway, that's the two episodes, and you will leave your thoughts on the show in the comments below. Doing like, doing like a hand movement. You can't see, but I'm doing a hand movement. Now, we are running a competition right now and giving away three copies of The Batman on the 15th of June, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episodes. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. 
If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of the Thor trailer, which will be linked on screen right now. We've gone over some of the Easter eggs in it, talked about the characters, and if you're into that movie, then you need to get into that video. If not, then thanks for sitting through this one. I've been Paul, and I hope to see you next week. Take care. Peace.